Welcome to Flipping Tables, where we bring all of our religious thinking to Jesus who flips the table for his upside down kingdom. I'm Julie Sexton, and I'll be your host. Welcome to season two, episode 27. It has taken many weeks to get to chapter 20 in our John series. We've spent 12 weeks on the Upper Room Discourse and the events surrounding the arrest, the trials, and the crucifixion of Jesus. I hope that you have enjoyed these episodes and found them to be a good investment of your time. But finally, we get to talk about the resurrection. And I love the details that John wrote down for us to carefully consider because John's aim in writing his gospel is to present the evidence clearly so that we arrive at the same conclusion that he did. Before John saw the risen Lord, John believed based on the evidence left in the empty tomb that Jesus had indeed risen. And today I'm joined at the table by my friend Susan. Susan and I met, we think maybe about nine years ago at a women's retreat. And since then we have been at all kinds of tables together. And I am delighted to have her in the co-host chair today and She's been a faithful friend and a listener of the podcast. She volunteered to come to the table. So I think that takes a lot of courage um, to be on a podcast. So Susan, I appreciate that so much. And I hope that my other friends and listeners will follow your example because, as you know, my favorite thing to do is to gather my people to discuss Jesus, His Word, and just share our lives together. It's even better if there's food involved, which I have no food for you right now, (laughs) but, um, you know, this is kind of why we do the podcast so we can talk about Jesus. So Susan, why don't you take a minute and just introduce, um, yourself to our listeners? Okay. Well, as you can probably tell, um, I am from a little tiny town in the Southwest corner of Virginia. You probably hear that in my accent. Um, I have known, like I said, we've known Julie. I've known Julie for about 10 years, nine years, 10 years. Um, I'm a fellow Bible nerd and book nerd, a language arts teacher. So that goes with the territory. And um, as a, I'm kind of fangirling right now to get to be in this seat. (laughs) You're hilarious. No fangirling needed. Um, And we have almost our matching readers on because we're we're of that age. We are. We found out that we're fellow reader wearers. Middle age is fun. And not only are you a teacher, middle school teacher, but you also have a counseling degree. I do have a counseling degree and hope to transition to that very soon. I enjoy um, thinking about gone through some tragedy in my own life. And I feel like that was something that I um, went through in order to help other people. So um, I'm anxious to put that together one day soon, hopefully. Yeah. Well, I, um, I love some of the insights that you'll be able to bring um, to this episode because there's really a lot to kind of analyze um, because there's a lot of emotions and a lot of feelings and trauma. um, Yeah. So we're going to like kind of starting out kind of in this, um, you know, it's almost like a sober feeling Mm -hmm. that is going to transition to just this overwhelming joy. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's amazing. But um, as you know, Susan, I've been to the Garden Tomb twice, and both of those trips were absolutely amazing. And the second trip, I got to teach this John passage in the garden near the tomb, the empty tomb, and I was leading my own group, and it was, I have to say, it was one of the top highlights of my life. I felt so connected to Jesus there. It's it's really hard for me to put um, into words. I still I think my profile pictures on all my socials is still a, from that day, because and that at this point was you know a couple of years ago and I just thank God every day that I got to go to Israel. Yeah, it was just such a life changing experience for me, and. I love 
Mary of Magdala. Mm -hmm. And she is actually my favorite woman in scripture. I can't wait to meet her. I felt such a kindredness. Um, that makes me think of Anne of Green Gables, right? <laughs> yes. Isn't that what, they, what Anne and her friends said? They were they kin do, yes. kindred, kindred spirits. spirits yeah. Well, that's how I felt about someone that I don't know. Um, but just teaching about the cross and the resurrection in Israel and thinking about Mary and this encounter that we're going to discuss tonight, it, it's just absolutely amazing. Um, and I went to a dinner, uh, I think it was last Thursday, and at the dinner, it was a long table filled with women. Some of us knew each other, some of us um, didn't know each other, so we were doing an icebreaker. And the question that was asked was, who would you most love to go to dinner with? So there were lots of celebrities. There was Dolly Parton. There was just all kinds of people. And when it got to be my turn, and I was like, you know, you called yourself a Bible nerd, and I am definitely a Bible nerd. And so I didn't, I was just like, I don't know how the room is going to feel about what I'm going to say because it's so different. And I didn't want anyone to feel bad because they had chosen, you know, a celebrity or something. Um, but I said... I would really like to have dinner with Mary Magdalene. Such a cool choice. I do like the way the um, Chosen portrays her, too. I, I like too. her character. Um, I, I think they've done a good job. I do, too. Um, and so, I mean, I would love to just talk to this this woman who walked so closely um, to Jesus. And I mean, I consider her a disciple. Many people consider her a disciple. And all the other women that were traveling with Jesus, you know, we consider them to be disciples. Jesus, um, he's a table flipper. He is. And that's what he was doing. So I'm going to start reading, but I'm just going to read verse 1 of John chapter 20. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So I think right off the bat, Susan, I need to pause and we just need to talk a little bit about the first day of the week mm -hmm. because the resurrection ushered in a new beginning. We know that the seventh day of creation is when God rested because the creation work was finished. And then the Sabbath was observed that seventh day as a memorial. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the resurrection had to be on the first day of the week um, because we needed a new <laughs> beginning. It just makes uh, sense to me mm -hmm. when I think I about that. it. Going from like, I'm like, of the day, you know. I love that. I, I love the new beginning part of that and how that reminds us every Sunday um, even every morning of, of new beginnings. I, I love that. Yeah, I mean, because like that's what we why we gather on Sundays right. is because that's our new Memorial Day. We remember that Jesus is the resurrection. Yeah. And that's where all of our hope comes from. Faith isn't what brought Mary to the tomb. Faith mm -hmm. and hope, they had all but died in Jesus' disciples, both men and women. Mm -hmm. I believe love is what brought Mary to the tomb. She came to serve Jesus. And the other Gospels name other women who came with her, but we're just focusing on Mary because that's what John did. So Mary Magdalene and these other women, they had been traveling with Jesus, and I've already said that they were like his disciples, and they were supporting Jesus and out of their own means. And that's what we get in Luke 8. Because in Luke 8, verse 1, it names the 12 disciples. And then in verses 2 and 3, Luke takes this time to talk about, name all these women that were traveling with them as disciples and that they were serving the ministry. And so, because I love Mary so much, I um, I want to clear up a few things for her because <laughs> I think that's what good friends do, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's what you do for me. That's what I do for you. But I know that there are traditions that have connected Mary Magdalene to the sinful woman who anointed Jesus's feet. Um, and then there are people who say 
that you know she was a prostitute and there is no evidence to tie her to prostitution and this in my opinion is a very hateful tradition mm. um, probably fueled by the patriarchal society um, that they lived in and I think where that seven where um, in I think it is Luke 7 that at the end of that chapter is where Jesus is anointed by this woman um, who washes, you know, his feet with her hair. Um, people get confused and think that that's Mary Magdalene, probably because Mary of Bethany, Lazarus's sister, does it, you know, towards the end of Jesus's ministry, yeah. right before um, in that last week. And so all the Marys in Scripture, don't you think we just get confused by those? Absolutely. There's a, there's a lot. <laughs> there are a lot. And you know, if, we were, if we were going into the other Gospels, we would see that there was a whole bunch of more Marys. Yes. They're at the crucifixion. Right. Right. And yeah. so, you know, I just, I don't know, I get a little bit defensive of her. I've read and studied because I'm like, am I wrong? And I really don't think that I, that I am. Um, and we've talked about um, some of that in the past, but the one of the, the details that we know about Mary is that Jesus had driven seven demons from her. So she was under this extreme oppression and torment before Jesus. Mm -hmm. But then Jesus set her free. He had given her everything. He'd given her life back. And I believe she loved Jesus with everything that she had. And Me that's too. why she has showed up um, at the tomb. He flipped the table for her. He absolutely did. <laughs> and let's think about her. She's exhausted. Yeah. She has spent three days and I know the tradition has taught us that Jesus died on Friday, but it was most likely Thursday. And I've covered this in previous ep episodes, so we're not going to go down that rabbit trail today. So if you think about the crucifixion being on Thursday, Mary's probably been crying for four days. You know she was crying, watching the crucifixion. How could she not? She loves him more than life itself. And... Like for four days, she's been waiting until the double Sabbaths have passed, the the Passover, the first day of unleavened bread, um, the regular Sabbath, um, which may have fell on one of those days. So she had been waiting because she just wanted to do one more act of service for Jesus. She wants to care for his body, even though. She stood and watched Nicodemus um, hauling 75 mm -hmm. pounds of aloes and spices. So Jesus' body has been cared for. But I believe getting back to Jesus over those days had consumed her. And her fortitude, in spite of the physical and mental strain that she had to have been under, I think is absolutely remarkable. I mean, what do you think about that, Susan? Absolutely. And... um Trauma wise, she is feeling shock. Oh, yeah. Um, she is probably feeling even, um, you know, shivers and um, cold think, chills. I mean, do you think she even thought to eat? It's probably oh. been days since this lady has had anything to eat. She's seen some incredibly um, tragic things. Um, she's probably angry. She's probably fearful. Um, she probably, you know, confusion. She probably just doesn't know which way to turn. Um, and then she's listening to all the, the chatter. I'm sure. Oh yeah, is another um, another issue. Probably, absolutely. I I I appreciate you know you bringing bringing all those things up. The point I think I want to make is she wasn't at the tomb because of faith and hope. Mm -hmm. She was there because all she had left was love. And you know, as I've thought about that. I want to be like this. I want to be a woman acting in love against all odds. And I think that that's what we see her doing. I feel like she's really triumphing over her broken heart in this in this scene. And um, Susan, one of the things that I love about you, and even the first time that I met you, is you have such a tender heart. You have experienced, you lost both of your parents um, at a young age and 
Um, you recently lost a dear friend who I have, um, you know, prayed alongside with you. Mm-hmm. I've never met her, but um, you were always asking me to pray for her. And you have, I mean, she went through a long, what, four or five years? Almost five years um, battling breast cancer. So, yeah, um, I, I'm well acquainted with grief. Um, I've always said that I am the poster child for what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, but I think I think that is, is Jesus. I think that strength, um, had I not had him at a young age, I did lose both my parents. So I think um, as far as grief goes, you do search for love. Yeah. And someone who's grieving needs that love. And you can, you know, there's tons of things you can do when someone's grieving. You can take food. You can, you know... But ultimately, what those people want is just someone to sit there. They just want to know that they're loved. Their words, you probably won't even remember what they said five minutes after they said it, five seconds. But, um, yeah, uh, my friend Ashley passed away actually two months ago today. Um, And so while I grieve her, I I actually grieve the relationship that I had because I know because of this resurrection – Ashley doesn't have breast cancer anymore. Right. And I will see her again. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, you know, I remember having experienced grief so young in my life as well. But I remember, like, going to, like, a grave graveside and, you know, seeing my parent, parents sit there. Um, just because that was as close as they could get. Right. Like, we knew that she wasn't there anymore, my sister. Right. But you wanted to get, and that's what Mary's doing right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. The um, I've actually been, been helping um, clean out Ashley's house. And that's kind of the same way. Ashley isn't there anymore. But I do that because I loved Ashley and because her, I, I feel close to her there and her family needs me. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so I, I love – time doesn't heal wounds. Um, they don't go away, but love is definitely a um, an aid. Yeah. A, a huge in that healing and, and just that need to, to go back to where you think of that loved one for sure. Right, and, you know, Mary is used to living, you know, in proximity with these other disciples. Well, they're all in the same condition that she's in. Sure. So it's so difficult. I mean – I'm sure that that being together probably helped mm-hmm. because I, I know that it has helped me, but still. They've seen a lot. They've uh, they've witnessed a, a lot, like I said earlier, a lot of trauma Yeah, in those last couple days. All right, Susan. Well, let's um, – I'm going to have you read verses 2 through 10, and okay. then we'll talk through that. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple – the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying in there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So, Peter and John have apparently been together. And I have kind of... that thought has just rolled over in my head and I just kind of picture John because John stayed at the crucifixion and I just picture him telling Peter all the details about all of the agony of the crucifixion and I believe that Peter had been inconsolable I think they both were I think they all were I don't believe that they were running to the tomb because they expected Jesus to be resurrected even though we know they had witnessed Jesus raise Lazarus. And that had not actually been too long. Not too much time has passed. And 
Peter and John were in that inner circle, so they've seen Jesus raise Jairus' daughter. They there was um, the widow's son at I think Nain, yeah, um, and so they've seen Jesus, and Jesus has told them. But they didn't listen. They weren't very good at listening and pondering. And I just, like, when I read this, that's kind of the backdrop of where I start thinking. And I know in the text, and we all make jokes about it because it's kind of a funny little detail (laughs) for John to include, including that he outran Peter, right? I mean, there's a million reels about this. Mm -hmm. So much, you know... um, So many jokes about it. Uh, But when he got there, John held back and he didn't rush right in. And so I've been thinking about that. And all I can come up with is I think John was emotionally spent. Mm -hmm. I think he'd used up everything that he had in the tank to get through watching Jesus die. I think he's exhausted from grief. I think in this moment... It really helped him to lean on Peter's boldness. I agree. Um, Grief is definitely exhausting. I think there could be some fear there. Um, I mentioned the chatter earlier, and, and, you know, they're they're probably hearing things. It was a scary situation they had seen. So I kind of wonder if he was holding back a little bit out of, I don't don't know what I'm going to find in there. Some fear could be involved. See, I think that's a really good point because... Mary said has told them that the sto- that the stone was rolled back. But I think John got there and he's like, if his body is in there and I have to see him oh. again. Mm-hmm. Like I you know, I mean, there will be things that I have seen like in a movie or something and I'll rewatch it, but I close my eyes when I know that that thing is getting ready to happen cuz I don't want to see that again. Right. And I think John is just like, I cannot do this. I can't do Peter, it. I, Peter, I need you to be the guy right now. Right. I need a minute. Yeah, I'm going to need a minute. So let's talk a little bit about Jewish burial details because I think they're really important. Um, bodies were laid face up in the tomb. The bodies were washed. They were wrapped in strips of linens with spices tucked in the folds. That was kind of a, a new insight to me. I didn't understand that. I didn't know if they laid the spices out, but tucking them into the folds, that helped me visualize that better. Mm-hmm. Apparently, they left the shoulders and the neck were left bare. They didn't wrap that in the cloth. And there was a separate face um, cloth. And apparently, they twisted it kind of like a turban around the face, which I thought was really interesting. Mm-hmm. And so... Different um, translations of the Bible handle the face cloth detail differently. Um, Three of them translate the verse with the word napkin, and that's the King James, the AS, and the RSV. But others translate it with burial cloth or handkerchief or face cloth. And what I have found is the Greek word comes from this Latin word that means sweat. And it can refer to a towel for wiping sweat from one's face. It is used in the Greek to denote a towel or a cloth, but not specifically a table napkin. And I'm and I wanted to, to clarify that because another thing about the Jewish people are they do a lot of hand washing. So they did hand washing before the meal and after a meal. Remember, they didn't have utensils like we did. So they were using their hands while they were eating. Um, And there's no evidence that they used napkins. And this is important because from what I have, I have, I've seen this and read this many, many times on the internet. But since around 2007, there is, been a tradition that the napkin was folded at the end of a meal and if that was fa- if it was folded that it meant that a person was returning so there's lots of have you, have you read this very much so and um I, I'm a little my hopes are a little dashed my, my bubbles a little popped <laughs> because, it, because it made us feel good it to did. read that yes but I don't think it's true 
Um, I, I did some research on it too, and um, it was like the person kind of read this and then put two and two together without doing any research. Um, and then once the research was there, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. So I think we should try to stick to referring to this as a burial cloth, yes. not as a napkin. So the burial cloth, it was separated from the strips of linen, but it was not necessarily folded. Um even though there are two, and this is um, the NIV 84 um, actually uses the word folded, and so does the New King James Version, but the NIV doesn't do that anymore. So what you read out of the red, Susan, was from the NIV, the new NIV, which I think was updated in 2009, and it was, um, they don't say that anymore. They don't say that it was folded. They just say that it was separate. Okay. How did they say it? They said the cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen, meaning the strips of linen. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's just really, really kind of interesting. And apparently that Greek word actually means to twist or to entwine. Um, so that, again kind of adds credence to the, that his it was probably wrapped around his head kind of like a mummy mm-hmm. it's, and, I, and so like just, I don't know I'm very very visual and that really helps me mm-hmm. um, so a couple of things that else that I want to point out is when you were reading Susan um, in verses 5, 6, and 8 there are three different Greek words used for, in verse 5, John looked, and in verse 6, Peter saw, and in verse 8, John saw and believed. And those are not the same word. They're all three different words. And they kind of like really add layers to this because the first um, with John, when he says he looked, that word simply means sight. It just means he saw it. Um, but in verse 6, when it says Peter saw, that's a different word, meaning that he didn't just see it, but he was beginning to build a theory as to what happened. Mm-hmm. And then in verse 8, when John has finally gone in, and it says John saw and believed that word saw there means that John came into understanding. And what it is to me is that his faith was resurrected when he looked at the evidence. I can't help but go back to classroom lingo to my teacher background and see that it's like the light bulb coming on. It's like the process. It is. You, you know, he, he saw it, he kind of absorbed it, and then he, he saw and believed it. He understood it fully. And um, that happens, you know, with with concepts in the classroom. It's kind of cool that it it related to me that way. Um, Yeah. I I knew that you were going to love that with with your English. um, (laughs) But even I just, it really helped me even to see that Peter was thinking. Yeah. And he was building a theory. Right. As to what had happened. Sorry. He understood it cognitively. You know, it it reached his, um, it reached his understanding, like, like you said there. And that's. Yeah, because they're looking and they're going, okay, these strips of cloth, they are undisturbed. This face cloth um, is still separated, probably still twisted and shaped like a turban. Um, John Stott, a commentator who I like, he said that the resurrected body of Jesus just vaporized, Mm -hmm. just passed through. And since later Jesus does pass through walls, this adds credibility. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that's the way I've always pictured it. Yeah. I just pictured him just kind of like rising through those just like his vapor. Right. How cool is that? I mean, it's amazing. I mean, I want that to be my superpower (laughs) so I could get places without... um, Without red lights in Lexington? (laughs) Without red lights anywhere. I just don't like to be in a car, you know. (laughs) Same. So, John saw the evidence. His faith was resurrected. And he's the first person to believe in the resurrected Jesus. 
and they leave the tomb. And I think those two guys put their heads together. I believe they're discussing it. I think that John's faith was probably helping Peter continue to build the theory based on what he's seen. He's, and I wonder if Mary had already made it back or if they passed her on the way. But we got to talk about Mary now. She is back at the tomb. If I was her, I would be wondering, what what's going to happen to me now? What am I going to do now? The body's gone. This is what she's been anticipating coming back for. This is probably the thing that has kept her going mm -hmm. is that she was going to be able to go and serve his body, that she was going to be able to express her deep devotion to Jesus by caring for his body. Mm -hmm. Because this is the last place that his body was located, and she just can't leave. Like, she's just kind of stuck, mm -hmm. which I think is a contrast to Peter and John, who kind of came and conquered, and then they've left. They didn't stick around, which I want to be like, why couldn't you guys just stop and help her? Like, why couldn't you? Like, it's just I have so many questions, but honestly, I'll, I, I'm glad that they didn't stay. Right. I think that could be indicative of her trauma, too, that she just she was stuck. And that's a you know, that's that's something we can get stuck in our grief. We can get stuck in the. This happened here, and I don't want to move past it because it takes away the memory of that person, or it takes away, you know, when things were good. Um, so and yeah. don't you see her as persistent? Oh, absolutely. She, she is, is demonstrating more than de just devotion mm -hmm. and love. She is persistent in that. Mm -hmm. And I see her tearful persistence kind of as this um, embodiment. It made me think of... Um, Jeremiah's prophecy that if you <laughs> seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me. Oh, I think she absolutely found Jesus. Yeah, I, I mean, she, we know she knew him, you know, and um, because of what he did for her. Like he found her. He found her. He delivered her. And now she is like, you are my life. Right. So, Susan, will you read verses 11 through 13? Sure. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept. She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken a my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. Okay, so the tomb is no longer empty. There's these two angels positioning themselves in a way that reminds us of the way that the angels are positioned over the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, which I think is a great detail. Mm -hmm. I think Mary could care less. I don't even think she knew that they were angels. No. Because, and if she did, she didn't care. Because, And she's not scared of them. There's she no doesn't fear. seem to be. So isn't that interesting? It is. Like, everybody's always scared of angels in Scripture. They're here in the, the tomb, and she just seems to have, like, very little reaction to them. Mm -hmm. um, so in verse 14, it says, At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. So again, remember, when we first started this chapter, it's dark, um, or it's close to dawn, and Jesus isn't wearing the clothes that would have been familiar to her. He probably had one set of clothes that he wore mm -hmm. all the time. And I don't think she was expecting to run into Jesus. No. So why don't you read verses um, 15 through 16? I'm going to let you read the really good part. <laughs> he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary... And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. When he says her name, mm -hmm. she knows him because she recognizes her shepherd's voice. And Mary is modeling how a sheep responds to the good shepherd. And I think we're beginning to see a hint of a new type of relationship that believers have with Jesus after the record resurrection where you follow his guiding voice yeah. and oh it's so so special that he first talks to her and it's like she kind of faces towards him but i feel like she turned back around 
And she's looking back at the tomb like, I can't move on. Mm -hmm. And then he says her name. And she turns right around and looks at him. Yeah. Oh, so good. Um, Will you read verses 17 through 18? Yes. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Okay. So there's a lot um, of interesting thoughts about this whole him telling her, do not hold on to me. And I really don't want to get into it on the podcast episode, but there's some transitioning. There's some things that are that are happening, that are changing. Um, lots of people have really good thoughts and theories about it. I've always thought that I love that after the resurrection that he didn't immediately ascend to the Father, that he kind of waited um, around. And so he's watching this unfold around the tomb, all this activity. Um, John just gives us such a a small glimpse of it, but at the same time, I feel like he gives us the most, um, he gives gives me what I want. Right. Like, I I just love focusing on the reactions of Mary and Peter and John without a lot of other people because I would be if if we were talking about if we were reading in Matthew I would have to think about all the things going on with right. them right. but right now I can just I can focus on these desi- disciples who definitely Peter and John are like my favorite it's always like a mm-hmm. they're, it's kind of like a foot race and who I love the most of the disciples mm-hmm. between the two of them and I've already said how I feel about Mary but it's like, what what is going on? So we'll get a little bit more into that in the email lesson that I send out. But why do you think that Jesus appeared first to Mary? Like, what's like you you're a woman. You love this. I do love this. I, I think that that he did that to validate, um, you know, in this culture, women would not have been regarded as uh, worthy of of an event of this magnitude. Not that everyone would have believed in this, but um, he appeared to her, I think, to validate her position. And I love that when she looked at him, she said, Rabbi, but at that point, he was her redeemer also. And I yeah. think he wanted to put that in bold. Um, look, look at what I did for you yeah. and, and to the rest of us. Um, both men and women. Look at look at what I did for you. Well, and that hints at like the the transition in the relationship, right? Mm-hmm. She called him teacher. Yeah, and that's what he had been, and he would still be her teacher. But when she raced back to the disciples, mm-hmm. what she call him? She called him Lord. Yeah. I have seen the Lord, and I um. It means so much that he gave this honor of witnessing and announcing the resurrection yeah. to to this woman. Who was totally devoted to him. Absolutely. And from what we can tell, she immediately obeyed his command. Oh, yeah. It doesn't seem like she hesitated for a second. <laughs> and I, it, I kind of thought about this. Because a lot of times we see, and I don't want to come down hard on men, but sometimes we see men being a little passive, right? And I do think that's a fallout from kind of the from the curses. Mm-hmm. And I have been reading, and several commentators believe that John tries to really spotlight this mm. in various patterns. I've been reading where. There's comparisons to the way Peter walked through Jesus' arrest and crucifix. I mean, denied him three times right. and, and stuff. And then kind of like spotlighting Mary's devotion and kind of the the going back. And until I really have spent this, this much time in John, and John's always been my favorite gospel, 
and I've studied it in depth um, many times, but I guess maybe, honestly, I think having gone to Israel mm-hmm. and just some of the the new the new things that I understand about the culture and the differences between the four Gospels and their aims, that John is being really true to his aim. Mm-hmm. And I think oftentimes, like, there's this pattern where, um, like in the beginning of John, where um, – he encounters Nicodemus mm-hmm. in chapter three, and then in chapter four, the 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 woman at the well. And so you've got like these two different responses to him revealing who he was to them, right? And two different reactions. And so there's, I I think there's that's maybe why um, John wrote this the way that he did because he just really wants to. To focus on that, I also think um, that this is kind of a nod back to to Eden, mm. to Eve, yeah, to let a woman be the first one that he appears to. Mm-hmm. It's a real reversal. It it's a real turning point. Mm-hmm. And the more and more I read the scripture, and I know you like to read it chronologically, like I do, and as you've done that. And when you read the Gospels and you study Jesus' ministry, you see so many connections back to the the beginning, back to Israel, back to – it just flows. Yeah, everything falls in place. Right. I mean, Jesus just really is reversing and doing things. And so to me, it makes a lot of sense that Mm -hmm. that it kind of goes back – and it could be that it was just her persistent love. Oh, yeah. Because she stayed there. She did. Like, we were talking about it from her trauma response of being stuck right. in grief. But because she stayed put and set, and I think that's like a really good, I'm like, that's, this is a really good lesson. Because what you said about, and I know you sat with your friend Ashley a lot at the end of her life. Right. And now you're still sitting with her family. Right. And coming alongside them. And there's something about taking the time to process and to feel and go through sure. all of the emotions and feelings, right? Very necessary. Absolutely. Yes. And so it may be in a sense that this was really good because she stayed put. But as soon as he spoke to her, hmm. as soon as he gave her something to do, right? this woman who has served him, she takes off. Mm-hmm. Like she's wanted to be with him for days, and now she's with him. But as soon as he tells her to do something, she obeys. Right. Right. So I think that puts into perspective the devotion that Mary Magdalene had to Jesus, the the relationship that's there. Yeah, she was devoted to him. And one of the things that I read that A.W. Pink said was, it could have been just this simple, that Jesus was just rewarding her devotion, mm. that that's why Jesus chose her. She was so heartbroken, and she was so devoted to him she needed to see him. Hmm. And I really love thinking about it that simple. Because yes. he's a personal savior. Absolutely. And he knows what each one of us need. Mm-hmm. And, you know, somewhere, like, in the back of my mind, I know, because in First Corinthians 15, uh, it talks about Jesus... In the appearing in the order that he appeared, it seems that there is in those verses, and I'll put it in the show notes because I'm just kind of talking off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. But um, that he privately appeared to Peter, mm-hmm. and I really, really appreciate that because as we keep going in John, we're not going to go into it tonight, but we'll get into it in the next episode. He doesn't 
this is happening early in the morning that he's appearing to Mary. And then they don't see him again until the evening. And so it seems like somewhere in between he appeared to Peter. Peter. And it just makes me feel so good that Jesus is so personal. Oh, absolutely. And I feel like, you know, maybe she was kind of like the the woman kind of leader. Mm-hmm. And then Peter was his leader. And Peter had, was devastated because of his... I mean, I don't know. It's just fun to think about. It is fun to think about. And it's... You know, I know I've, I've needed um, that kind of, of interaction. And while it's not a, a face-to-face, I feel like he's just as personal oh, to me now. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. And... We're not in competition. We don't ever have to, like, be afraid that someone has more of Jesus. I think we have as much access to Jesus as we want. Yes. If I don't feel like I'm getting enough from Jesus, it's it's all on my end. Right. It's right? not because he's not revealing himself, yes. Yeah, I, yes. I agree. But I also think that just commissioning a woman to announce the resurrection you already said it earlier in the episode. It was a table flipping move. <laughs> it was Jesus preparing them as the disciples for the Great Commission work. And to start with a woman who wasn't even able to testify in court, women had very little agency in this patriarchal society. In giving this assignment to her, a woman, Jesus was opening the door for women to lead in the church, this church that was going to be birthed on uh, Pentecost. And when you um, introduced yourself earlier, Susan, you mentioned that you were from a small town in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And Mary was from a small fishing village in Galilee. And, you know, I went from a small town in Kentucky (laughs) So, again, that makes me feel a little more like a kindred spirit to her. But there is little doubt in my mind that she was ostracized in her hometown before Jesus healed her. Sure. In following Jesus, Mary became a powerful and poised leader who served him and gave out of her means and of herself, that she was, like you said, wholeheartedly devoted to Jesus. And she became a leader in the early church. Yes. I, I'm very aware of um, what you said about the uh, dinner where you were talking about um, people you would like to have dinner with. And she is absolutely worthy of somebody to, um, I'm going to steal it from now on. That's that's who I want to have dinner with is Mary Magdalene. Well, you know what? We'll do it together. We'll do it. We'll do it together. Like, we'll have dinner with this amazing woman because that's what's before us. Absolutely. And it's because of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Death is no longer our enemy. No. It hurts. There's some sting. But eventually, it's off of our... It's all taken care of. It will be all taken care of. And, I mean, I admire her so much. She makes me proud to be a woman. She she definitely makes me proud to be a woman. And she definitely teaches me how to be a follower of Jesus. Absolutely. I agree. I say that all the time. Absolutely. I think it's one me of too. my catchphrases. <laughs> i got to stop saying that. Me too. But I just, I mean it. Yes. Oh, wow, Susan. This has been a lot of fun to talk about the resurrection with you, one of my really close friends, and just to build this anticipation anticipation of a future where we get to sit at a table and talk to Mary. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, thank you for being a guest at the table. And as you know, we like to wrap up with a bright spot. So, what do you got, Susan? Wow. Um, I want to wrap up with like five. So, uh, I didn't mention that I was um, a mom. I have a 20-year-old son and a 14-year-old, almost 15-year-old daughter. And a couple nights ago, um, my son and I were throwing the football in our front yard. So that was a bright spot. But I have to um, I have to give credit. This is a bright spot. I'm going to remember this for... Okay, you're going down to like your second one already. 
Yes, I am. Okay, enough of my bright spots. Julie, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just teasing you. you what's what's your second part of your bright spot? This being here, being here, being at the here. Table. Yes, absolutely, and um, possibly some pickleball after. I hope so. Julie has converted me to be a pickleball player. So yes, yes. I, it's it's one of my missions now. Tell people about Jesus and, and get pickleball. People to play pickleball with me. That's yes. <laughs> my my second mission um so let's see my bright spot is i got to go to a conference last week in nashville and i got to sit at tables and be taught about this horrific thing of human trafficking hmm. and learn from great leaders and you're like that doesn't sound very bright but what's bright mm-hmm is all the women on the other side of it yes, who were sharing and teaching and are leading in ministry and being warriors. And I am so thankful to have seen that. And I got to set at tables with women. And, I, and there was one just... I ended up at the same table with her a couple of times, and she told me some of her story, and it was so incredibly moving, but it's redemption hope, right? Mm -hmm. It's women coming from horrible situations, things that have been done to them, and they've got a new future and a new hope. A little reminiscent of Mary Magdalene, right? Absolutely. So I think that's a good bright <laughs> I spot think so too. for this episode, which I hadn't really thought about that. I, I literally just thought of my bright spot on the spot. <laughs> um, but because of bright spots, I'm always thinking about them now. So mm-hmm. I'm kind of collecting bright spots every day. Yeah. So friends, collect your bright spots and thank Jesus for all that he's doing in your life and around you. And remember, he is the resurrection. He is a table flipper. We follow this table flipper and we leave the table flipping to Jesus. 